Welcome everybody to chapter seven, inflation. As with the last chapter, I wanna encourage everyone to watch the video lecture on consumer price index that's on inflation. It's about uh, a little under six minutes long and it explains uh, several of the slides in this PowerPoint presentation. I'll cover them very briefly, but I'm really gonna rely on you to go into those, uh, into that video lecture and to see the explanation of consumer price index. First, what is inflation? It's an increase in the average level of prices, not a change in any specific price of a good. So it's an average price change of a group of products. Uh, the prices of a specific basket of goods, and you'll hear me use this term in the video lecture, are collected and computed into an average price level for that basket in a year. Uh, the rise in that average price level is inflation. A decrease would be decrease, uh, deflation. So they put a bunch of products in a fictional basket. They just come up with the prices for a bunch of products and then track that over a series of years and the changes in the price equals inflation or deflation. Relative prices. Uh, the market mechanism causes the prices of individual goods and services to rise or fall. Uh, this supply and demand issues, as we talked about in chapter three, will cause this quite often. Uh, you also have the issue of relative price. This is the price of one good compared to the price of other goods. Buyers switch from one good to another uh, as the relative prices change. So as the price of your favorite spaghetti sauce increases, uh, to a point where it's not worth it anymore, you may switch to your second favorite spaghetti sauce to save a dollar a jar. Inflation is a rise in the average price of all goods, uh, and it's not a market function. We'll get into this more in future chapters, how inflation is quite frequently, and many people to believe solely a function of the size of the money supply. Once again, we'll talk about that in later Effects of inflation. Some prices rise and some prices fall. Rising prices require to reallocate your purchasing power to ensure that you get the most satisfaction per dollar spent. So as prices rise, you may change what you, where you spend your money because you may feel that the value that you once, once got out of purchasing a certain product is no longer there. One area where many people have done this is moving the money you spend from going to the movie theater as those prices have gone up to now getting subscription movie services like Netflix. <clears throat> Nominal income. The amount of money uh, income received in a given time period measured in current dollars. Real income, income in constant dollars, nominal income adjusted for inflation. So as you get a raise, your nominal income may go up, but if it if your raise does not keep up with inflation, your real income is actually falling. And real income is typically expressed in dollars for a certain year. A popular one that is often used right now is $2,005. So you could watch your yearly salary decrease in $2,005, but your nominal salary may increase, but the rate of inflation is driving that real income down. Uh, redistribution of income and wealth by inflation. Inflation is uh, a redistributive process. People with nominal incomes rising more slowly than inflation end up worse off. So that's what we just talked about. So if your income is not increasing as high or higher than the rate of inflation, buy more than the rate of inflation, um, your actual buying power decreases. People with nominal incomes rising faster than inflation end up better off. So if you're uh, income is rising, say, 4% a year and inflation's at 3% uh, per year, your buying power is actually increasing. Wealth effects. Those who own assets that are, de that are declining in real value tend to end up worse off, and those who, are, uh, who own assets that are increasing in real value tend to end up better off. Quite often, real estate is at the front of inflation. So as inflation goes up, so does real estate. So real estate is often seen as a protection from inflation because those assets will increase. Uh, cash is the exact opposite. If you have a stack of $100 bills, the buying power of that stack of $100 bills is always going down as inflation goes up. So that's an asset that is always declining in real value. 
the money illusion, using nominal dollars rather than real dollars to gauge changes in one's income or wealth. So quite often we just say, hey, I made $50,000 last year, I made $51,000 this year, I'm doing better. Well, that's a 2% uh, increase. And what if inflation's at 3%, you're actually going backwards. Uh, the exercise they give is, in the good old days, a movie ticket was 50 cents and the minimum wage was a dollar. Well, now a movie ticket is about $10 and the minimum wage is, is less than that. So you can see the shift. Uh, when you compare the purchasing power of the minimum wage today to the good old days. All right, macro consequences of inflation. Uncertainty. Not knowing the prices of goods in the future makes purchasing and production decision making much more difficult. So as inflation takes hold, knowing what something's going to be worth in the future, not knowing what something's going to be worth in the future, uh, makes purchasing awkward. You don't necessarily know if it's a good idea to buy something or not. Uh, speculations. Decisions will shift from standard economic activity to betting on the future prices of goods. If, if inflation is driving prices up, you may jump into real estate to try and protect yourself from inflation, but you're just betting that it's going to go up. You're guessing that it's going to go up rather than knowing. Uh, another macro consequence of inflation is bracket creep. This is extremely dangerous. Uh, our tax brackets are set up in non-inflation-adjusted inflation numbers. So the numbers for our tax brackets do not increase based on inflation. So as inflation drives all of our wages up slowly, we advance through the tax brackets so we are actually paying more in taxes, even though our real income may be decreasing, our buying power may be decreasing. So if, if our income is increasing at 2% a year, inflation is at 3% of the a year, we're actually losing buying power and over when this happens year after year, we'll actually be paying more in taxes because we're moving up through those brackets that don't change. Uh, this is very intentional on the part of the government uh, simply because it results in more tax income and they don't raise or change those brackets till they absolutely have to until the, the financial pressure is too great or it actually starts to hurt the economy in a quantifiable fashion. Deflation. It's basically the opposite of inflation. Uh, it, you just switch everything around. This is when prices start to drop. And your buying power as a consumer actually increases. However, most economists believe this is far more dangerous for the economy than inflation. Here's the reason why. In a deflationary situation, in order to sell a product, like a flat screen TV, for example, the seller has to drop the price because nobody will buy at the former price. They have to drop that price to entice people to buy. And as they drop their price, their profit decreases and maybe eventually goes to the point where they can't stay in business any longer and still sell their products. For example, the only price at which people will buy their flat screen is $500 and yet it costs $600 to make. Well, they're gonna go out of business like that. So it will, deflation drives people out of business. It also decreases profit, where if you're selling at $500 and it costs $495 to make, there's not too much meat left on the bone there and you're gonna have to redu reduce your, uh, your staff. You're gonna have to lay people off in order to stay in business. And when those people are laid off, they have less money to spend, which drives prices down. It decreases demand and drives prices down even further. So a deflationary cycle can be very dangerous because it results in uh, unemployment very quickly. Businesses are, are, uh, are driven under, they, they have to close. And this is what happened during the Great Depression. There was a tremendous amount of deflationary pressure and businesses uh, closed and, uh, and people were laid off in droves. We got up to 25% unemployment, it was quite dangerous. And one of the lessons learned from that was that if we can fend off deflation, we can limp along for a while till the economy picks up. And that's essentially what we're doing now. Ben Bernanke, the uh, Federal Reserve Chair, who we'll talk about in future chapters, is a student of the Great Depression. And he's decided that he would rather print money out of thin air to prevent deflation and, um, 
he, he prefers to do that um, at the risk of massive inflation later. So his thought is do whatever it takes to prevent deflation and we'll pay the price of inflation later. And he actually has the power to pull money out of the money supply to reduce inflationary pressure at later times. And so that's the route we've taken because we didn't want to go that same route uh, that we went during the Great Depression. We don't know how this one's going to turn out yet. Printing money to avoid a uh, to avoid deflation in a, in a depression is relatively new, especially at the scale at which we're doing it. So it'll be interesting to see in coming years how all this turns out. Consumer price index. This is covered in the video lecture, so I'm going to go pretty quick through this part. It's a measure of the average price of the consumer goods and services. Used to, it's basically considered the inflation rate and that's the average change, average increase in those prices of goods. There's many problems with this. Once again, those are discussed in the... Uh, basically what they do is they select a market basket of goods. Uh, they select a year in which they're gonna reference those goods. I believe it's 2005 right now. And they're gonna set a price index in the base year. The price index in that base year is always 100. And then our distance from that 100, the amount we've increased to buy that basket of goods, is going to be our inflation rate. And this shows how that rate is calculated. All right, I won't hold you responsible for any of this on a quiz, uh, but it shows how this is calculated and you can reference this back to the other video. Other measures of, measures of inflation, you have core inflation. This is changes in the CPI, excluding food and energy prices. We often see this number. It's kind of a scary number, right? Because most of the price increases we see are from food, uh, which we're seeing huge jumps in the last couple of years, and energy, which is gas prices and electricity prices. And as those skyrocket and really hurt us, this number throws those numbers out. Uh, producer price index, changes in the average prices, uh, intermediate steps of production, these are the changes in prices to produce products. Uh, and GDP deflator, changes in prices in goods of all services included in the GDP. And this is usually what's uh, used to adjust GDP from nominal to real. But going back to that core inflation number, when you see a core inflation number, uh, I don't really understand, to be quite transparent, um, what the purpose of an inflation number that excludes food and energy because once again those are, are two huge expenses for every American and as those increase our buying power for other items decreases so uh, once again that's a very deceptive number computing inflation rate from the CPI so this is basically how you would proceed to, to calculate inflation using CPI and it's really pretty basic Price stability. This is the goal. This is what we want to achieve, is a, is a stable level of prices, which means that we are increasing less than 3% per year. And this was established uh, by the Full Employment Balance Growth Act of 1978, that we want to keep, we want to be as close to full employment as possible and keep inflation to less than 3%. And, uh, and that's really the charge of the Federal Reserve uh, branch as well and the Federal Reserve Chairman. They, these are the goals that they are trying to achieve by manipulating interest rates and the money supply. Once again we'll talk about that in future chapters. Measurement concerns. We are seeking price stability at the lowest possible rate of unemployment which we just discussed and from year to year there are quality improvements in the basket of goods so that we want that those goods in that basket to improve in quality. So we want to move from the CRT television, the big bat one, to the uh, next level of technology, which is the flat screen or the high definition TV. We want those changes to happen. We want to move from the VHS to the DVD, to the Blu-ray, to whatever's next. Uh, we want those changes to make in the basket of goods. Causes of inflation. Well, we have demand pull inflation. So as demand goes up, it pulls the prices up. So as demand for products, if there's demand for cars, as demand for all products goes up, it's gonna drive prices up and that creates inflation. This, create, this is, comes from a booming economy. 
or too much money being pumped into the economy by the Federal Reserve. So they're increasing the amount of money in the system too much. There's too much money going into the system, that money ends up in the hands of the people, which increases their buying power, which increases their demand for goods, which, in, which will pull inflation, which will make the prices higher. And then there's also cost push inflation, and this is due to higher production costs. Uh, so as production costs go up, suppliers have to increase their price in order to stay in business. Protective mechanisms. Uh, we have several things built in to protect people from increasing inflation. Uh, first of which is cost of living allowance. These are uh, nominal incomes are indexed to automatically rise at the same rate as inflation. This is something you see with Social Security. Uh, Social Security payments are changed with are given a cost of living adjustment uh, every year. With, well, it doesn't happen every year. They research it and look to see if it needs to happen every year. Uh, and everyone getting a Social Security payment will get more money, a cost of living increase. And you also have adjustable rate mortgages. These are interest rates on a mortgage that raise a uh, that increase with inflation to protect the lender. So if they lend you money on a house at 3% and they've given you an adjustable rate. As inflation increases, your interest rate will increase. And this is one of the triggers in the Great Recession. A lot of people went into arm loans hoping that they'd get really low rates, which they did, but as inflation increased, those rates went up and they couldn't make their payment any longer. Uh, one of the things we've seen with Social Security as well, going back to the cost of living allowance, is that uh, we have played, our government has played at many times with that uh, inflation rate, tried to keep it artificially low, which we talk about in the video. They try to keep it artificially low because if, if it were any higher, the increase in payment for Social Security benefits would increase at such a rate that we couldn't afford to make those payments any longer. So to keep Social Security solvent, we have had to falsely decrease our true inflation rate.